What's up, everybody? Sunday Sessions, episode 31, bringing you all the information you need to know about growing a profitable Amazon business. In this episode, we're going to be talking about ASD, which is a very profitable trade show that we suggest you attend if you sell on Amazon. It's happening in Las Vegas, August 21st to 24th. We're also going to be talking about some other topics. So excited to have you here. Appreciate you joining. Stay lit. So topic of discussion today is ASD, August 21st to 24th. If you're not going and you sell on Amazon, you should be there, right? You need to immerse yourself in an industry. And the best way to immerse yourself is to go to the events where industry, people in that industry are attending. And one of those events is ASD. So I strongly encourage you to go to ASD. Let's see, we got some questions about ASD flowing in here. We got Nashville in the house, Orlando, London. What's up, everybody? Appreciate you being here and spending this time with me. Oh, tips on ASD Market Week. Yeah, so I just actually posted, if you're part of the eSellers or I community, jump over to the Facebook group. I just posted everything you need to know. I'll kind of give you a little recap here. Um, but essentially, ASD is August 21st to 24th. The two days that are a priority to go to, the two days that you definitely want to be there are the first and the second day, the 21st and the 22nd. So I suggest flying in on the 20th, right? And you can leave on the 23rd or the 24th if you want to extend your stay and make it business slash personal, which I usually prefer to do when I'm traveling because it's a business expense, right? So you go out to nice dinners, stay at a nice hotel, and you write it off and you, and you only pay for about 65% of the trip because it's deducted at the end of the year, which makes sense. So you wanna fly in on the 20th, you can leave on the 23rd or the 24th or even late night on the 22nd if you just wanna be in and out. You definitely wanna attend at least, you need at minimum one full day, recommended two full days is recommended because the trade show is rather large. You should bring comfortable walking shoes, to the event, you should bring a cell phone charger, some mints because you're in close proximity with people, a pen or a tablet to take notes on, minimum of 100 business cards. The reason why business cards as opposed to um, some of those new digital business cards is because a lot of these companies that you're meeting with, they're old school. You know, the owner's 65. You think he's using a digital business card? He ain't using a digital business card. And when you show him your digital business card, he's gonna have no idea what it is. So get yourself some business cards, 100, 200 business cards max, plenty. Also, you want a good night's sleep. You know, for all you Vegas party animals, we're going out there, make sure you recognize what you're committing to. You know, you're committing there for a business trip. So don't get hammered the night before and show up to the event, you know, four hours late. That's not good for business. Hotels. Right, last thing would be hotels where you wanna stay. Now, I suggest staying somewhere connected to the uh, Las Vegas monorail. So that's like Bally's, MGM, Harrah's, all those hotels are connected to the monorail. And the reason why you wanna stay in one of those is because the monorail goes directly to the trade center, to and from. So it's very convenient, very convenient. And then also communicate with your friends. If you're in any seller's ride, talk to people in the community, see where they're staying, so you can capitalize on the network on the networking opportunity and the ride share opportunity. And then you get to go out to eat with people. There's just really so many opportunities there. It's pretty crazy. Um, but that's pretty much it. ASD is free to attend. I also suggest going to asdonline.com and reviewing their vendor registry, right? And if you can't make it to the trade show, you should still be looking at the vendor registry. You know, it's easy to build relationships in person. That's why I suggest going to these trade shows. That's the foundation of our business growth. I'll give you plain and simple right now, one of the main components of the reason why we are lar as large as we are today is because we literally go to 15 trade shows a year and we've been doing it for six years. And I'll, I'll continue to preach trade shows and I as a business owner will continue to go to every single one of them and every trade show that I go to, I will continue to tell all of you, especially our eSellers or I community, what trade shows we're going to, when to be there, how to get there, what you should be looking out for and how to prepare because it's fucking important. It's so important. You gotta be building those relationships. What's up from Florida, Chicago in the house, what's up? You do over 30 million a year, but I've never seen you drive anything fancy. Yeah, I drive a 2018 Nissan Altima. It gets me from point A to point B. I've never been a car guy. 
I've just never, growing up, I had this neighbor down the street, Shaq, we called him, he was a big guy, his name's Aaron. Um, Shaq was always a car guy, you know, motorcycles, cars, that just was never me, and I don't think I'll, listen, when I go on vacation, I like to write nice, nice cars, but the reason why I haven't bought a really expensive car is because, honestly, when I go, you know, like a couple months ago, I was in Florida, rented a Bentley, right? I got four or five days out of it. After four or five days, I was done with it. It's like, all right, this is nice. But that's not me. That's not me. It's just not me. Yeah, so the game plan 300 and 300 C money. I don't know if you're in East Sellers or I, but you're asking a lot of a lot of good questions and, and East Sellers or I would be great for you. Um, but he asked or she asked, do you just ask vendors if they accept Amazon sellers? Yeah, it, it's, listen, that's the short of it, you know, but it's not like we just walk up to him. Hey, I'm Eric. Do you accept Amazon sellers? Like there's a finesse to the conversation, right? Usually, uh, I'll, I'll break down right now what I do when I, when I walk up to a table, right? Let's say this is the table I'm walking up. Brand new vendor walking up. I see a product, I pick it up, I look at it, right? Out of the corner eye, I'm making sure that the account rep who's walking around notices me looking at the products, right? Because I'm trying to get that connection there. So I'm just looking at the product. They're gonna walk over to you. They're gonna say, hey, what's up? You know, what's going on? Welcome to ASD, this is our booth. And you're gonna say, you know what? I actually purchased this product. I carry this product right now. And you know, you should know your numbers or you could check it real quick in your app. And you could be like, right now I'm paying 250. Can you do any better than that? You know, if you can do 220, I'll take 400 of them right now, right? So there's not only opportunity to grow relationships, but there's opportunity to make deals on the spot. It's fucking crazy. Sebastian and I were just talking last night, and last night we were talking about one of the most recent trade shows we went to. It was a vendor we've been doing business with for only about nine or nine or 12 months, so fair, a fairly new vendor, right? But it was one of their trade shows. At that trade show, we placed a $450,000 order at the trade show. And literally the entire order was filled over the course of three months and shipped to us, right? So like opportunities like that just don't present themselves when you're cold calling and emailing vendors. They just don't present themselves like that. It's just not how it works, unfortunately. You need to be immersed in the industry, and ASD is a place to do that, as well as Expo West, Expo East, Fancy Food Show, um, the Toy Fair, New York City, uh, Miami Mart, Philly Mart, all of these trade shows are trade shows that y'all should be attending. What do we got next? Chia. Do you guys use TA to look through the ASD vendor's website? No, I do not use TA. Um, Here's the thing, I love softwares. I fucking love softwares. And the best way to explain how softwares make us stupid is Google Maps, right? Because I've been using Google Maps for, and this is all gonna come together, just give me about 30 seconds here. I've been using Google Maps for, I don't know, two decades, right? And I know absolutely how to get nowhere because Google Maps, I just look at my app and I drive where it tells me to go. I'm not paying attention to the roads, to the street signs, to stop signs, to any landmarks. I'm not paying attention because the, the, the application tells me where to go, right? Same things with these UPC scrapers, tactical arbitrage, scan unlimited, wholesale inspector. Same thing with all these, these softwares you're using, right? They show you the path but what they're missing is how they got there. It's super important to know how they got there. So I'm a firm believer when I'm looking at these, I'm just using experience, which some of you might not have. And the best way to get an experience is by doing it, right? So when I'm looking at one of these vendor websites, I'm popping open their, their websites, their links, looking at their page, and just looking for brand name products. If they have brand name products, go to send them a quick email. You know, hey, it's Eric. Pleasure to meet you. I operate a large e-commerce distribution company. I'm interested in opening up a wholesale account. Can you please send me over an Excel file with UPCs, case pack, and pricing, and available quantities so I can place an order. I'll have one over by the end of the week. Right? Very straightforward, very simple. And then if they respond, this is where you gotta leverage experience, right? And then if they respond, let's say, Hey Eric, thanks for reaching out. Unfortunately, we no longer work with Amazon sellers or we're not taking on any new Amazon sellers or we don't sell to Amazon sellers, right? Most people would open that email, read it and go, oh shucks, and that's it, right? They just give up right there. Absolutely not, I'm not giving up right there. I didn't grow one of the largest Amazon businesses in the world by giving up. You're not gonna grow one of the largest businesses by giving up. You're not gonna grow any business by giving up, right? So you gotta respond. 
and say, hey, thanks for the information and insight. Is there a reason why you don't work with Amazon sellers? Are you currently, and then you could look at their listings on Amazon. There's usually a few reasons. They're either currently working with a few Amazon sellers directly, they're either selling their products themselves on Amazon, or they're going 1P, which is vendor direct, and Amazon selling their product. Now, whichever case scenario they're giving you, there's recoil to all of them. If it's 1P and they're selling directly to Amazon, the goal would be to convince them to no longer sell directly to Amazon using 1P vendor direct and to sell to you as 3P instead of 1P. And what this is gonna do for them is Amazon has 90 to 100 day, 180 day net terms with their 1P vendors. So imagine being a brand and Amazon selling your products, you have no control over your pricing, the brand is dealing with the same customer support that we're dealing with as third-party sellers, as one-party sellers, they're dealing with the same customer support, and they really can't control the price it's listed at, because Amazon, if they want to move more inventory, they'll drop it, right? So that's a huge value add. Now you got a company that's working 1P direct to Amazon, and you can convince them to move their 1P business to your 3P business. Fucking game changer. Now the other scenario, let's run through this, right? The other scenario would be, they say we're already working with, let's say three or four third party sellers, right? Well, from my experience, being in the industry for nearly a decade, not once has there ever been a company that hasn't changed three party, third party sellers. It just doesn't happen like that. They rotate them, people mess up, businesses fail. They're constantly looking for new third-party sellers to take their business onto Amazon because those initial four that they're working with right now, there's a very high chance that one or two of them, three of them, or even all four of them aren't gonna lock, work out in the long run. And that's when you swoop in and finesse them with logic and knowledge and insights, and then you start managing their brand, right? So it's just a little insight there. What's the best way to find a private owner operator to get an FTL shipping cost down? So the best way would be to use a third party broker. Unishippers is a great one. Um, what's the other one? Like H H W Morrison or something. There's a, there's a bunch of them. You can just Google brokers. And then once you start getting these drivers, come to your warehouse, start talking to them. Right? You open up a conversation. That's how we got our sole owner operator driver that basically just works for us and a few other Amazon companies right now, uh, but they take six shipments a week. So, you know, when the, when these drivers come to your warehouse, I'm sure you got some returns laying around. I'm sure you got a six pack of soda. Like just give them some stuff. Hey man, you know, you want this boom box or, you know, just lather them up and say, hey, you know, I actually send four shipments a week to Amazon. Would you consider taking them? And then the person will weigh the pros and cons of it and give you an answer. And then boom, you got your own carrier. No longer dealing with Amazon partner carriers. It's a fucking nightmare. Uh, Miguel said, ASD for arbitrage or wholesale and private label? So it's for wholesale. So ASD, and there's private label companies there as well. So there's there's some private label companies, um, which is smaller than it's been in the past ever since COVID because most of the private label manufacturers, they're coming from overseas, you know, China, India, Turkey. So they're flying in and... and uh, presenting their booths at ASD, but since COVID there's a little more restrictions, but it's mainly for wholesale. So ASD is what we call a distributor show, opposed to more of a brand direct show, like Fancy Food Show, or Expo East or Expo West, is where you'll find a lot of smaller niche brands, uh, but at ASD you'll find a lot of distributors. Uh, what is the best way to make the turnover shorter? My case is that I'm working from Central Asia and it takes two months for the products to be sold and get my money for the next use. You gotta get more products, right? So right now I would assume, Maxat, that you only have you know one or two products, right? So the way it's working for you right now is you're ordering the product, it's taking whatever, 45, 60 days to get to you, you're listing it, it's selling, right? And then you're projecting based on sales, you're ordering it again, it's coming in, right? So what that's doing is creating a bottleneck because you only have one, one or two products that's generating revenue. The best way to solve that, which is also the hardest way to solve that, is to double or triple the amount of products you have, right? Because then you're not relying on the cash flow and the disbursement checks from those one or from that one or two products. You have access to more opportunity because you're selling more products on Amazon. Hope that helps, Mexop.
Hey, Eric, for newer sellers, would you recommend seller board or inventory lab for profit calculation? Um, so I know inventory lab, I don't believe, see, here's the thing. I, I, I don't use inventory lab, so I'm not aware if it brings, if it gives pop, uh, profit calculation. I know it documents cost of goods, and I know that um, the reporting from inventory lab is slightly off from seller central. But what I do know is seller board will provide that information. So as far as inventory lab, maybe someone else can chime in here. If inventory lab provides profit calculations or if it's just for tracking cost of goods. Um, so Miguel, follow up question, is ASD for arbitrage? Uh, so you will find if you go to ASD online that a lot of the vendors will essentially do what they call a drop ship program, right? Which is essentially you can order the product from them. They will ship it in a neutral box to the customer, you know, but most of them are going to want larger orders, you know, MOQs, two to $5,000, uh, large assortment of products. Okay. Rob said, yeah, inventory lab does give you profit results. So um, I would say for you, if you're brand new starting off, I would go with Inventory Lab then. Um, so the next question here is all the vendors mixed in together on the floor or are they spread out and sectioned off? So you're gonna find that they're spread out and sectioned off. So where you're gonna wanna spend most of your focus is in the West Hall, right? Because the West Hall is gonna have what they call value and variety. That essentially means wholesalers and distributors, right? That's where you're gonna spend 80%, 70 to 80% of your time will be spent in the West Hall. Also, in the other hall, there's beauty distributors, there's apparel, there's jewelry, there's cash and carry, and then there's the private label section. Now, what we've done as a consulting company who's been to literally hundreds of trade shows in the past decade is we've created a trade show walkthrough. So if, you, if you've never been to a trade show or if you've only been to a few and you're nervous or concerned and you don't really know what to do, that's okay. Because what we do is we meet, there's two times you can select, we meet on the first day ASD opens and we literally take a group of people and we walk the show floor with you, me and Sebastian and you, we walk the floor with you, we introduce you to companies we've been doing business with for years and we show you who to talk to and what to say. It makes your life a lot easier. Right, because my first maybe four to five trade shows, I literally barely spoke to anybody because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to say it. I knew what to say, but I didn't know how to say it. That's really the best way to explain it. I knew what to say, but I couldn't get the words out of my mouth to say it correctly. I didn't understand the vernacular. You know, so to alleviate the same pressure in your life, because I don't want you to have to experience that, we have a trade show walkthrough where you can literally just join us. Right, and we'll show you the ins and outs of navigating a trade show floor. At what age did you start your Amazon business? 34, so it's like 28. At what point in your business did you start going to trade shows? So I'll tell you, I'll give you the story behind our trade show experience, but it doesn't have to be like that for you, right? Because, so when we first started going to trade shows, our first trade show was probably 2016 maybe 2015, but I'm gonna say 2016. So at that point, we were already selling on Amazon for about two years, year and a half. We're mainly doing retail arbitrage for Costco, BJ's, Sam's Club. Um, we were picking things up, getting them shipped by the truck, by those, those retail stores. Um, and we just knew there had to be a better way. At the time, we were probably two, three million dollars in annual sales. We just knew there had to be a better way than literally going to a retail store shopping the aisles and buying 10 units of this, 50 units of this, five units of this, and 16 units of that. It was very time consuming. It just didn't make logical sense to us anymore. So we jumped on Google, Sebastian jumped on Google, and he found a trade show in San Francisco. First trade show he ever went to. It was, I don't even think it exists anymore, and I forgot the name of the trade show, but it was a health food trade show, right? which was real big back in 2015, 16. It was very trendy, right? Health food products. So we went to that trade show, we built some relationships, and we ended up placing our first wholesale order. It was for, oh, don't quote me on the title of the, the, the name of the company. I think Manitoba. Oh man, I gotta Google it now. It was like Sprouts or something. Manitoba Harvest, fresh hemp. Yeah, it was, it was maybe a hemp, Manitoba. Harvest I got here. Anyway, back to the story. Yeah, hemp hearts, Manitoba hemp hearts, exactly. Got a full truckload of hemp hearts. 
and crushed it and crushed it. And that was our first wholesale order. You know, but in the day and age we live in now, fast forward eight years, like there was no Facebook accounts talking about Amazon, no Instagram accounts talking about Amazon, no YouTube like here talking about Amazon. Nobody was doing what I'm doing right now. So we had to figure it out for ourselves. You don't have to figure it out for yourself. So to answer your question, when should you be going to trade shows in your business as soon as you can afford to get on a plane and go to a trade show is when you should be going. So if you started your business yesterday and finances aren't a thing where you're not living paycheck to paycheck and you can book a flight, go on United right now, book a flight to Vegas, head out there, use your business credit card, deducts your taxable income at the end of the year. Listen, a lot of people talk about spending money to save money. I'm a firm believer in it, right? Last year, at the end of the year, I made a decision to invest in an $80,000 mastermind to reduce my taxable income because the way I see it, $80,000 or let's call it, let's say the, the business trip to ASD, $5,000, right? If you don't have to pay tax on that $5,000, you're essentially saving 35% of that, you know? so. 35% of 5,000 bucks, like 16, 1,700 bucks back in your pocket, right? That you, you would have just been giving to Uncle Sam anyway. So that's the logic behind that. Nice, Rob said, I'm proud to say that I broke 10K a month for a couple of months conservatively and even got a 5K loan from Amazon. That's huge, brother. Congratulations, man. So happy for you. That's amazing, that's what I like to hear. Big distributor wants proof of warehouse and 24 hour available forklift. UK based, can't risk a three year lease at 15K a year until I have the account. Trying to use someone else, but no luck. Yeah, so some of these distributors will have requirements like that, especially some of these larger distributors. They will definitely set prerequisites. What they'll do is they'll Google your address and they'll actually look at your, your site, you know? And if you don't have an address to give them, then they're not gonna open that account. That's why having a warehouse leverages the growth of your company. You know, and unfortunately for you, SEO daddy, I feel weird just saying that, but uh, you can do what you said. You can either leverage someone else's warehouse, right? If you got a friend who owns a business, has a warehouse, um, you could also go to a local business in your community um, or wherever you plan on getting these products shipped and offer them some sort of financial contribution in order to use their dock door to get your products dropped off and then you come through with a trick pick, pick them up and, and get them out of there. So there are some options there. Unfortunately, I've never been in a situation where there's a big distributor like that and I was able to convince them otherwise. For example, when we used to operate out of Sebastian's home, you know, there was just some companies that didn't want didn't want, want our business because we're operating out of house. And unfortunately, there's just some companies that aren't going to want to open accounts with you unless you have some of the requirements they were talking about, like proof of a warehouse and 24 hour availability to a forklift. Now, because they are requiring that, it sounds like a great opportunity. So figuring out what you need to do, even, you know, I don't know what, I'm assuming you're selling in, in US or UK, because you, you said that in the UK, 15K a year for the lease. Yeah, so those are two options. You either fucking buckle down, say fuck it, I'm doing it, get the warehouse, or you leverage someone else's. Or you just put that distributor on the back burner until you're in a better f position financially to make that investment in the warehouse, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Robert just brought a, bro uh, a, a great point. So if you ever run into a brand at a trade show, just pop up their listings on Amazon real quick, right? I like to use my phone, I have Keep on my phone. Um, I just like to pop them up, right? Look at the Keep of charts, look at the pricing, one of the best tips to secure brand direct accounts is to look at Keepa charts and look for inconsistencies in their pricing and their order availability so they're in stock rate, right? Because what most of these brands are having trouble doing is keeping consistent pricing on Amazon and keeping in stock products, right? So if you look at a Keepa chart and you see the price at 14, then at 18, then at 13, then at 22, then at 16, then at 15, and it's out of stock, for a week here, week there, week there. That is a huge, huge selling point to the brand. Like, listen, you focus on the brand, I'll focus on your business. I'll focus on Amazon, that's what I do. I'm an Amazon professional. You don't have to worry about anything. Returns, shipping, anything, damages, don't worry. I got it, advertising, listing creation, listing optimization. 
I'll do it for you. You sit back, you create more SKUs in your brand, send them my way, I'll list them on Amazon. You explain niche concepts really good like nobody else on the internet. How many monthly sales do you think are good to sell a product? So we'll pick up products that are selling as little as 20 units a month, right? It's all based on profits, you know? So I have no problem taking a product that's ranked 200,000 that at that rank I'm making $30 on, dropping the price $10, $15, bringing it down to 100,000, where I'm still making 10 bucks and maybe only selling 15, 20 units a month. You know, but 15 units a month times 10 bucks, it's $150 a month in profit. You got 10 of those products, you're talking $1,500 a month in profit. You got 100 of those products, you're talking $15,000 a month in profit. You got a thousand of those profit products, you're talking about $150,000 a month in profits. So don't sleep on the high hanging fruit. Everybody wants that skew that's gonna sell 6,000 units a month and make them $6. Like, listen, it's not, I got a lot of skews. Right now we sell 3,500 skews. The amount of skews I have that sell over a thousand units a month and profit me over four or five dollars is probably less than 10, right? So like finding those heavy hitters, they come, but in due time, you know, especially if you're just starting out, that first product you get, it's not gonna be selling, you know, 4,000 units a month, making 350 on it. It's just, it's just not, right? Because someone else is already on that listing because you're not the, the person who's going to, unless you're creating the listing from the rip, right, and controlling it, whether it's through 2D transparency, brand registry, IP complaints, whatever it is, whatever systems you use as a business, then you're gonna have competition. Uh, what's the max sellers you would get on the listing with, and are your prices matching the buy box? Yeah, usually our prices are match the buy box or win the buy box, so whatever our repricer needs to do to win the buy box, go up, go down, stay the same. We let the algorithm do its work. Now to answer your first question, the max sellers, I don't have a max amount of sellers. I think a lot of sellers limit their growth by limiting the amount of sellers. And now let me, let me describe, there's two different types of sellers on a listing. There's competitive sellers and there's non-competitive sellers. Now depending on the price point of the listing, usually a competitive seller is within a few percentage points of the buy box. So let's say for example, there's a product list at $20. And within a few percentage points of that $20, you got five or six sellers, and then you got a seller at 28, 29, 30. Those sellers are not considered competitive sellers because they're not even winning the buy box ever. The next thing I'd like to do is jump in to keep a buy box statistics, right? Because it will tell you, let's say there's 15 competitive sellers, which may seem like a lot, right? It will show you in the buy box statistics what percentage of the buy box they're winning. Right, so if all of those 15 sellers are winning, let's say five or 6%, then absolutely I'm gonna jump on. That means I can get five or 6% of the buy box share. Now, if one of those sellers is dominating and receiving 95, 96, 97% of the buy box, that would be a reason to jump away and not buy that listing because it's all about buy box allocation. Now, the last thing I'd like to say about buy box allocation when you're looking at a keep a chart and looking at what sellers are getting what percentage of the buy box, something I found out on a call with one of my inner circle members the other night is we happen to be both selling the same product. So we're like, you know what, this is so cool. Let's dive into the metrics. So we pull up the keep a chart, we pull up our sales, they pull up their sales and we're looking at it. Lo and behold, we look at the buy box statistics for the past 30 days, they have 60% we have 40%. I don't remember the exact numbers, 50, 40, 60, 40, doesn't matter. They had a higher buy box percentage than us, right? But we were still winning more of the buy box. So that goes to show me that buy box allocation also depends on the time they are giving you the buy box. Because he had more buy box percentage, but that goes to show me that they're probably giving him the buy box in the middle of the evening when less customers are shopping on Amazon. Because even though he had the percentage of the buy box more, we had nearly triple the amount of orders that they had. So buy box percentage is not just, you can't use it as the sole indicator of how, many how much sales you're going to get 
because it also has to do with the time of the day that they are allocating the buy box to that seller. And that's something that we could talk about for hours. I'm a small Amazon seller, only brand name goods, which trade shows you suggest you go to? Definitely ASD. You wanna be at ASD, especially if you're selling brand name goods. If you're selling brand name goods, wholesale is the name of the game. ASD is the number one trade show you should be going to. Uh, another one would be Fancy Food Show, which was just two weeks ago at the Jacob Javits Center in Miami. Uh, the Toy Fair at the Jacob Javits Center. I mean, uh, in New York, not Miami, in New York. Um, the Toy Fair at the Jacob Javits Center uh, is also great. Uh, Expo West and Expo East. It's the same six or seven trade shows, whether brand direct or wholesale distributor. This is from Momuza. For selling outside of the US like Europe, do you find suppliers out there or the USA? We sent a full container to the United Kingdom about four or five months ago. It cost us $11,000 to get it there. It was about a dollar a unit. So just based on that, I would suggest purchasing from the countries you're going to be selling in. Makes it much easier, right? You think about it, when someone's doing it from overseas and they wanna sell in the US, they're not shipping products. If it's wholesale, they're not shipping products from overseas to the US. Most of them, they're just buying products in the US and selling them on the US on .com, right? Same thing goes for other marketplaces. It will save you, it will make you a lot more money, right? But the best method would be to do an assortment of both, right? Because I'm sure there's some SKUs that even with the cost of shipping from overseas, we'll be able to crush it. And then the other SKUs you could just purchase from the country that you plan on selling in. How do I link up with you to learn how to move around the trade show floor? So if you're an eSellers or I member, you get a 50% off, it's $4.97. Um, I just posted the link in the Facebook group. If you're not an eSellers or I member and you'd like to join the trade show walkthrough, it's a thousand bucks, send me a message on Instagram with your email, we'll get you an invoice, we'll get you set up. Uh, how much should you be making before using Ecom CPA? You'd have to tell me how much their services are. Uh, but don't skimp on accounting. Don't skimp on accounting. It's gonna create a lot of issues in the future. You know, obviously if you're just starting off, you don't wanna be spending, you know, thousand dollars a month on accounting because you don't got it like that, you know? But I don't know what the cost of their uh, services are. So if you could provide a little insight, Johan, on you know what they're trying to charge you monthly, then I'll be able to give you a better idea. So why don't you do this, Johan? Let me know what they're charging you monthly and let me know what your average monthly sales are. And then I'll let you know if it's something you should move with. Which method to finding suppliers worked for you? So the two main methods and the methods that have found us the most suppliers, Google, trade shows, Google, trade shows, trade shows, Google, trade shows, Google, Google, trade shows, that's it. Some other great methods out there. I've also found some great suppliers just driving down Route 80, you know, looking at the trucks. That's another great thing. I'm sure you drove by literally probably 20 trucks in the past month that are great distributors, but because you were, you know, bumping hot 97, you didn't even realize it. When do you recommend moving from arbitrage to wholesale? How many sales do you recommend having, or what is your advice? I recommend, there's no, there's no sales or anything. Listen, if you can meet the minimum order quantity, which for most vendors is 1500 to $2,000, if you have that amount of money, as long as that's not the only amount of money you have, and you got a couple thousand dollars extra, then you should be placing wholesale orders, right? Imagine, like this product right here. This is just an example, right? This is my personal use. This isn't a product we sell. I'm pasty as fuck. So this is just an example, right? Like this product, you could probably, let's just say Walmart. I don't know, six bucks in Walmart, right? You go there, they got 30 units on the shelf, you scan it. Oh man, Amazon, I could buy this for six bucks. I'm making 350 every time I sell one of these. I'll list them FBM, it's a hazmat, nothing to worry about. I'll list them FBM, get them out my door, I'll make a bunch of money. You scrape the 24 units into your basket, you, you go home, you, you list them, you ship them, and then the 24 units sell in less than 24 hours because it's a great product and you did your research properly, and now you gotta go to 40 more Walmarts to get more products, right? I don't do that. I literally find this product in one of my wholesalers catalogs, probably 15 to 30% cheaper than they're selling it at Walmart. So they're selling it at Walmart for six bucks. I'll probably get it for four, maybe 450. And I'll order 400 of them. And they'll be shipped to my warehouse in three to five business days. Now a lot of you are gonna get stuck on the profits because some of those retail arbitrage products make it eight, 10, 15 bucks on, that's great. That's great. 
You know, I preferably like to make three to four bucks selling thousands, hundreds of thousands of units. An average month, we ship 250,000 orders, right? So I'm not chasing $8 profits at that point. You know, 250,000 times eight, what is that? That's $2 million a month. We ain't making that type of money. In profits? No, but I'm comfortable not making that type of money. Obviously, that's the goal. We want to get to that type of money. And we're going to build our way up. And the best way to do that is through Amazon wholesale and volume, my friend. It's the best way. It's the easiest way. And I literally have documented my entire journey for all of you. And you can watch it and learn from my experiences and not waste your time figuring it out for yourself. And it's called these sellers are uh, What's your opinion on drop shipping in Amazon, then transition to FBA or hybrid or both? Drop shipping, trashola. Literally trashola. Just don't even think about it. Don't even consider it, right? Unless you're going to do it within Amazon's terms of service, which means you can't be purchasing from Walmart, from Target, from these big box stores and shipping it to customers unless you get it shipped to your house first. And then essentially it's not drop shipping, it's online arbitrage, right? But there are companies you could partner with who do offer drop ship programs, but once their fees are added in, you're not making any money anyway, right? I'm at the forefront of this shit. Literally, you guys know all these automation companies, automation this, automation that, automation drop shipping, we'll build you an automated drop shipping. All these companies are now reaching out to me because their drop shipping business are failing and they have hundreds of clients who paid them tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to manage their stores and they can't fulfill on their promises, right? So they're reaching out to me and saying, hey, Eric, we need to transition our entire 250 stores to wholesale, we need your help. You know, and I let them know, okay, we'll help you. It's gonna cost you at minimum six figures because we can fix that up. But drop ship is not the move. It is not the move. How do you get into our group? Send me a DM right now. Right, or after this call, send me a DM, fire emoji, and you got two options, right? I can either send you a link, you could join the group, you could be in the community watching videos on how to grow your business in the next 10 minutes, or if you have some additional questions before you sign up and you wanna jump on a personal phone call with me, then let me know and I can send you a link to my calendar or we could jump on a phone call because I want you to be comfortable with your investment, right? Doing drop shipping to build capital. Right, which don't get me wrong, it's a great way to build some cash flow up, but it's also a great way to get your account suspended. Great way to take the past six to 12 months you've been putting in work and throw it all down the garbage and have to create a new uh, Amazon account and get like an IP address fucking hider and like all that shit and navigate outside of the terms of service because you didn't want to navigate within them from the beginning. Right, and I'm just speaking from experience here. Literally, we offer a service where we help people get accounts reinstated. In the past year, we've done 300 of them. 250 of those were for drop shipping complaints on Amazon. Drop shipping? You want to do Shopify? Go for it. Right? Amazon's just super strict. What's the best websites with a list of vendors, distributors for brand name product? There aren't any no websites like that, man. Not that I'm aware of. Just like a website, you go in and it's got a list of every single distributor. There's companies like, or there's websites like Owler.com where you can see companies' competitors. Owler, like an owl, like whoo, er.com. How do I get into your group? I've been in another group, but I did 195K in one year. I'd like to help you 5X that. Um, Looking to get into wholesale, but the other groups are no help with this. Yeah, send me a DM, man. We'll get you set up. It's not a problem. Literally, we built the best Amazon community in the world. I don't care what nobody says about it because it is. It is. Literally, every single Monday night, we have a live call just like this, except you guys get to talk back and ask your questions live. It's fucking crazy. Every Monday night, I've been doing that shit for two years. Two years. So... The people in our group, I just want to spit out this statistic as a, not, not as a flex, but as proof of concept, right? The people in our, in our eSellers or I group sell $60 million a month on Amazon.com. 60, that's not including our 5 million. So if you include us, just our community's doing 65 million a month on Amazon.com. It's fucking nuts. What is that, 65 times 12? <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money being exchanged. And it's because we show people the right way on how to build legitimate Amazon businesses. 
We shipped out over over 200 awards. The company's breaking five. First $500,000 a month in sales. First million dollars a month in sales. First $10,000 a month in sales. First $50,000 a month in sales. What about the competitors? Many companies with the same distributor. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay, right? Competition is good at Amazon Wholesale. Keeps the market moving, keeps the market flowing. It's good so when you jump out of a listing because you're having trouble sourcing it at the right price or there's supply chain issues, there's other sellers selling on that listing, keeping the BSR low. So when you do find inventory, you can scoop back in, jump on that listing and make the same money you were making three months ago, right? So yeah, there's competition, but one of the best ways, I'm gonna take it back to the beginning of this call, one of the best ways to eliminate the competition is to build those personal relationships with these vendors that you're building relationships and growing with. And the best way to do that is at trade shows and also spending money, right? Because if I'm spending $200,000 a year with a vendor and you're spending 20K a year, I'm doing 10X what you're spending, I'm probably gonna get a better price. I placed my first 5K order and I'm not ungated in the brand. What should I do if Amazon doesn't accept my invoice for some odd reason? You're fucked, man. You're gonna have to sell the inventory. First, let me give you the solution to prevent the problem from happening in the future. A test listing. Very simple. Before you buy any product to purchase and sell on Amazon.com, go to add a product tab, create a test listing. It will, it will tell you the restrictions. Now for you, Cartier. You're just going to have to wait. My fingers are crossed for you. I'm hoping that invoice works. If it's a you know national distributor, it will, it will work for you. you. You shouldn't be concerned about it. If you have any issues with the invoice, I suggest printing it out. You can, next to the UPC, you can write the ASIN on it and then rescan it into your computer and send it to them. That could help um, if there's any issues with your invoice and they don't approve it on the first time. Sometimes we'll do that in resubmissions to get it approved on a second, third, or fourth attempt, which works. Because the way Amazon works is they have teams, right? And what most people don't realize is if you send an email at a different time of the day and a different day, you'll probably get a different team member. So if we ever get denied approval, like this gentleman's talking about, he's not approved to sell products, spent 5K on, if I got denied, sir, and I was used, or ma'am, submitting that invoice, I would submit it, let's say I submit it on a Monday at three in the afternoon, I'd submit it on a Wednesday at three in the morning, right? Because you're gonna get a different team to look at it. Dracker Suick asked, how do we keep track of how much money our community members are selling on Amazon, how much they're making on Amazon? So we, we have, a, in our private group, we have a, a, a drop down where they can select an award they've won. Right, so the actual number of our community and what they're selling is actually much higher than $65 million a month. It's probably closer to 100, but this is only based on the people who have voted for an award. So we have five or six awards, $10,000 a month, $50,000 a month, $100,000 a month, $500,000 a month, and a million dollars a month. And based on the submissions for those awards we shipped out, they total $65 million a month. If a product isn't selling on Amazon once it's shipped and in the warehouse, are you allowed to remove it from the Amazon warehouse? Yes, absolutely. It's called a removal order. And the fees for removal orders are, or zero to a half pound is 52 cents a unit. A half pound to one pound is 75 cents a unit. One pound to two pound is $1.14 a unit. And listen, you gotta have this printed out right here. Literally, I got this, I got the the uh, removal and disposal fees printed out right there, and I leave them there. And the reason why is because I'm always repricing products, right? And I wanna make a decision. So let's say here I got a six pound product, right? Six pound product that at the current price, I'm losing a dollar on, right? So we got a six pound product that we're losing a dollar on in order to sell it on Amazon. And you need to make a decision if you are going to lose the dollar or pull it back. Let's do some math here. We got six pound product, so anything more than two pounds. So it's $1.51 for the first two pounds. So we got one fifty one for the first two pounds. And then it's 63 cents for each pound over two pounds. So we're gonna do 0.63, um, six minus two, that's four additional pounds times four, so that's 252. So now we got 252 plus 152 for the first two pounds, 404. 
it would cost you $4.04 to pull that inventory back to you, when on Amazon you're only losing a dollar. But because you didn't read the, run the numbers, you pulled back the inventory, when really, if you looked at the listing, there could have been a chance where you could drop it another dollar or two and sell out your inventory and actually make a dollar or two more than creating a removal order. So it's like little things like that. You gotta know what Amazon's fee structures are. Uh, David Diaz says, what is drop shipping on Amazon and why isn't it allowed? So drop shipping on Amazon is essentially, let's say, we'll go take it back to this copper tone, right? You find this product listed at Walmart, copper tone, you then list it on Amazon and every time an order comes in, you fulfill the order from Walmart directly to the customer. That's drop shipping. Right? And it's against Amazon's terms of service because what happens when you ship this product that was in Walmart to an Amazon customer is it shows up in a Walmart box or it shows up in a Target box or a Kohl's box, right? Or a Foreman Mills, any of these retail stores, it shows up in their box instead of Amazon box. And if you get enough of those, your account will get shut down and then you'll have no business. Do you go over our purchases before buying them in the course? No. So I will not, you can't just, you don't get direct access to me where you can send me an email and I can review your order, but we do have live weekly calls. And if you're comfortable, you know, sharing the ASIN, I can pop it up and go and review it live with you. Absolutely. You know, um, for that more direct access that you're talking about, we're rocking, that would be more of our inner circle. Um, definitely with our inner circle right now, we have 25 businesses and we work with them for, it's a year uh, commitment and we work with them more directly and we absolutely, we review orders, we fly to their warehouses, we train their teams, we optimize their workspaces, we train their buyers, we help them uh, understand their metrics better, increase their production, decrease their overhead. We really analyze their businesses and work with them directly um, to help them do things like that. This person said, do you think Jordans will sell during a bad economy? I don't know, you know, and here's the thing with a bad economy. I was just talking to my mother about this because I sent an email to our ad team. I've realized that we run some ads on, on YouTube and Facebook and stuff, and I realized the customers we were getting lately were all broke. You know, they, had, they all had no money. And so I emailed my, my ad manager and I said, hey, uh, you know, ad manager, uh, you know, these past two weeks, the customers, the, 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 the submissions we're getting from our ads, you know, in our, in our email collect, they're just, they have no money. They have no money, you know? And, and she said exactly what you said, right? She said, Eric, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's economic crisis. We're on the cusp of a recession. We're in a recession. Like, uh, it's the people don't have money. And I responded to her. And I said, that's absolutely unacceptable. That's unacceptable. People always have money. I just need to target them properly. You know, you just need to target them properly. People always have money to spend, right? There's people who have lots of money to spend in recessions. You just need to find those people and offer them a service that they're willing to spend their money on, right? Now, when it comes to shoes, clothes, higher end products, you definitely will see a decrease of some of those in a recession, 100%. Right? Because a majority of the people don't fit what I was just talking about, the people who have money, right? Recession proof money. But with that being said, that's why I like to sell consumable products, right? Because I don't have to worry about selling Air Jordans or Nikes. I don't even have to worry about are people going to purchase this in a recession? Because toothpaste, mouthwash, chips, salad dressing, like all the staples that people eat and consume on a daily basis to feed their souls and feed their bodies, they're gonna use them no matter what. They're gonna use them no matter what and they'll always pay in convenience to get it to their house at a quicker time. So as far as Jordan's Nike goes, yeah, you could see a drop off, but what you won't see a drop off in is consumable items like deodorant, shampoos, conditioners. Have you ever opened wholesale accounts with brands directly? If so, do you recommend it? Yeah, yeah, we absolutely, but we call them more like brand direct relationships. Uh, now keep in mind, whenever you have a brand direct relationship, usually the cost of goods is gonna be a little higher, 
right? And the reason why the cost of goods is a little higher is because you're not going to be able to compete with the volume that their big national distributors are purchasing, right? So let's say a distributor is purchasing four truckloads, but you only want four pallets, right? They're definitely going to give that distributor who's getting four truckloads a better price than you who's only getting four pallets. So I always prefer to get products directly from wholesalers and distributors because you'll find that their pricing is even more competitive over the brand's pricing because they have to distribute their products. So there are options where Brand Direct is definitely more beneficial. Usually when Brand Direct is more beneficial is when you're the exclusive seller, where you're getting better pricing than you could find from wholesalers and distributors. We've worked out some sort of agreement where you're either enhancing their listings through optimization, SEO, enrolling their product in brand registry, uh, creating a storefront, optimized images, the whole nine, then that is an opportunity where a brand direct relationship would make more sense, 100%. But I personally prefer and I recommend for the most growth, especially if you're just getting started, the best place to find products is through wholesalers and distributors. Yeah, exactly. Deodorant, toilet paper, stuff like that. Do you think 3PL is a good option if I'm scaling fast because we, two of us, can't label all the pallets fast enough for inventory turn? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If you can't handle the work labor and you can outsource that to a prep center and still be profitable on those listings, absolutely do that, right? And then what it'll help you do is grow your cash flow, grow your capital, because the goal would be, I know right now you don't have a warehouse based on our previous conversation, but the goal would be SEO Daddy you know, four, six, eight months from now to be able to have a warehouse. And by leveraging that prep center in the interim, you'll be able to make more cash flow. So when you do get the warehouse, you'll be able to put an employee in the position of packaging those items. Because the first job that everybody should source to have someone else do in their Amazon company is prepping products. Prepping products takes the most time. It's the most laborious. It's the least fun, in my opinion. Um, and it's easily outsourced or insourced, which I prefer. I always prefer insourced. Just had a meeting this morning, um, fucking nightmare, because our VAs, there's such huge disconnects between our VAs and our in-state employees, right? So I personally always prefer in-house, you know, but you definitely could manage some, some VAs. Now, obviously, if you're going to need a labeler, they'd have to be in-house. But yeah, definitely. And eSellers RI is good for any country uh, in the entire world. We have about 45 um, international students in each LSRI, possibly. All right, my friends, it's been a pleasure. Appreciate y'all. Catch you on the next Sunday sessions. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, smash that subscribe button. Also, check us out on Instagram. We'd love to help you grow your business. I want to help you get from whatever you're doing now and 10x that shit. If you're doing $10,000 a month, I want to help you do $100,000 a month. If you're doing $100,000 a month, I want to get you, and I can get you to a million dollars a month. So let's do it. Send me a DM. I want to get to know y'all. I want to help y'all. Have a beautiful day. See you in ASD. Stay litty lit, my friends. Adios.